Hi folks, uh, welcome back to another episode of the Friendly Council. Uh, we're again here and Miha, our host, uh, has brought an amazing guest. Hello, Miha. Hello. Yes, we have uh, Steven today. Steven was uh, my teammate in the uh, 8 Regents event in Team Baratheon, so I think this episode will mainly be about Baratheon. Right, Steven? Oh, definitely. But, you know, a slightly different shade of yellow. Maybe, you know, closer to the orange side, I'd say. But, yeah, we can call that. <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> what deck are we building today? So, uh, we're building a Martel deck, not a Baratheon deck, unfortunately. Um, uh, we're going to be going with Martel uh, Valyrian Steel. Uh, a, a deck that holds a... Sp you know, slightly good place in my heart as it's one of the last decks I was able to play at a physical tournament in Australia before that scene was completely, you know, wiped away due to COVID. Uh, so, always a good deck for me. It's really nice. Um, Alex also presented a deck uh, near to his heart um, uh, for Greyjoy. So, mm -hmm. we have uh, another heartwarming deck with uh, Martell. Martell is always heartwarming, I would say. Oh, yeah. Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's why it's All the right. sun, you know, it's warm, right. <laughs> so, uh, Mattel yeah. Valyrian Steel is not the most typical uh, combination, uh, so I'm mm. looking forward uh, to how it will work. Yeah, I'm looking forward to explaining it. Uh, so, uh, yep, so we start off with Valyrian Steel. Uh, I, I, I guess I can get into the, uh, the cards themselves. Um, mm -hmm. uh, well... Valyrian Steel itself, you know, obviously we're going to be focusing a lot on attachments here. Uh, Martel, they have a very good mixture of control attachments, but lately, uh, and these are more recent additions that I made, um, they've actually got a few more uh, good positive attachments, such as, you know, like Sword of the Morning um, recently, that have, you know, really fit this deck and, and what it's trying to do. Um, it's a good mix of control of important lords and lady characters, uh, and it utilizes a really interesting mechanic that I will get into later, that I only realized the other week, which got me, you know, uh, excited again for this deck um, in a way that I wouldn't think of. Um, so with that, I would say it's probably best to start with the characters. That's all right, mm -hmm. um, as it would be better to explain everything as we go. Uh, so, this is one of the few decks that uh, this plays one of my favorite cards. Uh, three copies of Doran Martell from Sands of Dawn. So, Icon Doran Martell. And uh... the reason, the reason why, <laughs> just hearing hearing that uh, response is uh, reminds me this is a, this is the right choice. <laughs> um, he, this deck is is primarily about control, um, and you know. When you hear the word control and more specifically icon control, you definitely go with this Doran Martel. Um, uh, he also complements a bunch of the other cards in this deck uh, that you know we will get into later. But uh, we'll start off with the icon control package from the character's point of view. So we've got three copies of Doran Martel. We'd all also pack in three copies of Dornish Spy, I think for fairly obvious reasons. Um, there are other cards, you know, Ambush works very well on this deck, but there are also other cards that can help put that card into play. Uh, we also have Shadow City Bastard and Southern Messenger. Uh, again, two very key cards to most uh, Icon removal decks. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, a Ambush here in this deck, just, it just works very, very well. Um, so anything with Ambush and Icon Removal is a great plus. Um, uh, to complement things like Southern Messenger and a few other cards we'll get into later, this deck actually runs three copies of uh, the Fowler Twins as well. Um, mm -hmm. uh, forcing forcing your opponents into challenges, as, as I mentioned before with Sword of the Morning, for example, that's going to be a fairly prevalent thing in this deck. So three copies of Foul Twins, they're a fantastic cost for a cost for what you're trying to do there. Um, now we probably I'll probably get into some of the other lords and ladies, because I did mention that was a thing here. And so 
if you see three copies of Doran Martell, you know you also have to have three copies of Melario of Novos for, fa- for fairly obvious reasons. The second that she's on the board and Doran's on the board, he, your, your biggest card is protected. Well, from plots, of course, but primarily protected in, in the biggest way that he's going to die, which is like a Val of Mongolas or a Val D. This is also a deck that can actually utilize Malaria 100%. So we have Doran Martell, obviously. We will also have two copies of Ariane Martell, poor Ariane Martell, that is. Uh, as I mentioned, with like Dornish Spy and a lot of ambush cards, she's obviously she's a very obvious solution here to help get those cards into play. Um, and then we have one copy of uh, Tristan Martell from Bren the Builder. And one copy of Quinton Martel from Sands of Dawn. Uh, Tristane, you know, combo combine Tristane with a Shadow City Bastard, or with, as you can probably assume, the plethora of, the, I guess, with with because it's familiar still, the small pool of Martel uh, Icon Control attachments. Uh, he can really do some nasty work, um, and there's actually a nice little combo that I'll talk about it with him later on. Uh, and Quinton Martel is just there as he's a fantastic body for the cost. And this deck does utilize use plot tech just a little bit. So he does still fit in here uh, quite easily. We'll then move on to another staple icon control card. So, what, but it is just one copy of Nymeria Sand. That's um, uh, the road to Winterfell, Nymeria, of course. Um, and then along with that as well, one copy of Sands of Dawn, Obara Sand. For similar reasons to, you know, Ariane Martel, an easy way to get those cheaper characters into play at key moments. Uh, and yeah, Nymeria, it's pretty obvious why she's there. Now, going back to one of my favourite cards, this card here is definitely up on that list for me. And I always struggle to find a deck where he works in, but it definitely does work here. It's Oberon's Revenge, the Red Viper. Oh, um, I so. love him. It's my it's my favorite uh, Red Viper, I have to say. Yes. Uh, yes. Amazing. Yeah, really cool card. It's also, I think, a really good design because he can be amazingly strong, but it's also not super easy. Um, uh, basically, it's, it's not a trigger, but to get his uh, condition to work in your favor. So, yeah, I like it. Definitely, yeah. In, the, in, the, in this deck here, it has enough of those different icon control elements that... Or more specifically, surprise icon control, which is the subtle way that he has to work most of the time, uh, that he, he he works quite well. So, um, as you can probably tell with Alaria and what I've hinted at with sort of the morning, you know, you've got options of either pulling your opponent into challenges with their one icon characters, or there are other options to surprise your opponent with icon control after they choose to defend. So. This Red Viper is a fantastic choice for those reasons, and every time I see him, I get happy. So that's fantastic. Uh, did I did I mention did I mention one copy of Alaria Sand? I can't remember. I feel like I just mentioned it there. Mm, you did not. Okay. okay. Well, one copy of Alaria Sand. That's Sands of Dawn, Alaria Sand. Uh, again, same reason for. Oh no, I mentioned Fowler Twins before. That's right. Same reasons for Fowler Twins, like with Fowler Twins and Sword of the Morning. Just a very solid card to help pull those characters into play. Bit expensive in this scenario, but one copy of her. If you see her, you're not. You're always fairly happy. Uh, then there's four more characters that we'll get into. Um, mostly uh, one copy of Core Ariahota, uh, and this is just he's just a good card in this deck. Is not really working too well towards Arkham Control or something else, but you know. Everyone likes a cheeky Aero Hota every now and then. I know my opponents always do. Um, <laughs> uh, and then filling in for some of the Chud characters of this deck, you've got three copies of Desert Scavenger, three copies of Greenblood Trader, and two copies of House Dane Escort. That should be all 35 characters, a high character count, but it is a Villian Steel deck, so yeah. So, so far I've... If I understood it correctly, uh, the characters really support the two themes of that Mattel has with respect to icon control and yep. drawing in characters uh, against uh, their will. So 
it's uh, definitely interesting uh, and evil combination so, <laughs> that's that's definitely true and, and it's why i mentioned that this red viper works so well in those scenarios uh as well as you know every other card there to support that idea just that red viper sort of encompasses the the two themes of this deck into one card really well uh did you say 35 characters Yes, I, I'm guessing you've possibly missed one that I've said. Yeah, uh, I have 37, so it's two copies of, oh. of Shadow City Bastard and Southern Messenger, right? I think I yeah. added three by mistake there. Yeah, so yeah. I was actually quite interested about the, the numbers here, because Valyrian still obviously uh, says you have to have 75 cards, so I was wondering how that would then scale with the other card types, because uh, if you have something like 35 in a 60 card deck then uh, if you would increase uh, all the card types uh, by about the same level then you would get a few more i guess but uh, you are using the agenda to uh, get through your deck quicker i am guessing here by uh, drawing cards more than uh, by gaining gold yes so yes yes so this does it tries to balance the four card types fairly well uh, or fairly evenly, you know, keeping in mind that you will have to have a lot more attachments for the agenda to actually do its thing. And we do have solutions for draw later on, and I, I, I might get to that a bit later as well, because there's a very key decision to make if you were to play this deck and if you wanted to tweak it a little bit that I have run into in the past, completely related to, you know, in regards to draw and finding the right cards in that way. But yeah, it, it tries to balance those four card types fairly well here. Yeah. 35 characters is a little bit low, but there are ways to repeat the characters that you see on the board. So, yeah. Shall I uh, move on to attachments? Okay, this should be interesting. Yes. So, here's the interesting part of the deck for sure. So, obviously, all these attachments will be one copy, uh, and we will be going into one copy of all uh, four Icon Rival attachments being Beguiled, uh, imprisoned, attainted, and condemned. Now, I feel like uh, uh, explaining these is fairly obvious, just fits the deck very well. Uh, and one important thing here is I, I mentioned earlier with the Red Viper that surprise icon removal is very important with him. Or if you don't find those challenge pull abilities, then you have to surprise your opponent after they defend. Uh, Valyrian still unique, can uniquely do that for you by surprising your opponent with a uh, an icon removal attachment when usually you can't ambush that card. So, you know, that's where this agenda starts to shine when you start to surprise your opponent with these control cards like that. So we'll move on to other, now other uh, control cards just in general. Uh, you've always got to have one copy of Milk of the Poppy. That's, that's fairly obvious. Uh, Martel have a fantastic control card in the form of Secret Pact. Uh, here it's really, really useful both for, obviously, its effect, but uh, it's another ambush card. And later on we'll get into, you know, ways for you to utilize ambush cards a little bit better. But, you know, just it just the fact that it has ambush is very useful. Keep that in mind. Um, we'll then move on to Lingering Venom. Just a generally useful card, primarily because it's zero cost, but you know it can also have the potential to kill an opponent. Uh, zero cost attachments are fantastic, as it's a free trigger of Valyrian Steel. Um, speaking of zero cost attachments, we've got uh, Reckless and Sweet Sleep. Uh, Sweet Sleep, I guess, could be considered both a positive and a negative uh, attachment, depending on who it's on. Um, in this scenario here, it is always useful finding a sweet sleep and just putting it onto. Uh, I know I found a lot of use putting it onto like Mal Malaria of Norvos, for example, just to keep her a little bit protected in protecting other cards as well. Uh, or, of course, like Dawn Martell to prevent a milk of the poppy or something big. There are some cards where it doesn't work with, like Icon Viper, for example. Generally, you want to be stacking other attachments onto him, so yeah, you got to watch out for sweet sleep. It can bite you in the bite you in the back. <laughs> um, and then the final, I would say, the final control card would be Seized by the Guard. Uh, again, just a fantastic um, form of control here. You know, not really any bestow tech or anything, but fairly obvious why it's in there um, for location control. Uh, with that, 
we can probably move on to the more positive, the more fun, <laughs> nicer attachments uh, for your opponent. So one copy of Bodyguard seems pretty straightforward here. There's a lot of Lords and Ladies that you can protect. Um, there is also a, a very subtle interaction where if you chuck Bodyguard onto Ariane Martel, you know, using it to trigger your Valyrian Steel agenda, uh, when you return her to hand, you get that obviously get that Bodyguard back ready to re-trigger the agenda next turn. It's not always relevant, but in scenarios where you're choked for attachments, you know, you're not drawing as many attachments as you can, it can be surprisingly useful being able to reuse that bodyguard multiple times. Um, there's that. There is also uh, our uh, Seal of the Hand and Sword of the Morning, two very, very good three-cost attachments in this scenario. Uh, you know, I've had multiple scenarios where I've had the Red Viper with Seal of the Hand and Sword of the Morning, and my opponent's just conceded, because that's just terrible times. <laughs> um uh, where none of their opponents get to stand, really, uh, or get to participate in challenges properly. Uh, so that's great in itself. Uh, we then have one copy of Core Dawn, obviously the attachment Dawn. Um, again, similar reasons. that This has a bit of used plot tech in this, so Dawn is just going to be relatively useful. Uh, and another strength pump card, Otar's Axe. Again, similarly, just works with a lot of the you know, ambush or put into play characters that you've got in this deck. Uh, and importantly, it's another free trigger of Valyrian Steel by putting it into play for free. Uh, so that's always nice. Uh, we've got three more attachments. We've got Water Dancer's Sword. Again, similar reasoning to something like uh, Bodyguard, the Bodyguard scenario I mentioned. Uh, it's just another reusable attachment, and it it can go on to a lot of characters you have in this deck. Uh, we have, oh, technically this is a negative one, uh, we have Venomous Blade, of course. I can't believe I forgot about that one. Um, everybody loves Venomous Blade. I, I won't take any other opinions on that card. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, obviously you can, things like Ariane Martel, you can reuse that card very well. And here is my very fun attachment that I've been trialing for a while and it's just, it's always been useful. One copy of Patience. Stands for Dawn Patience. Okay, that's a first. Uh, yes. So this is an attachment that on the surface it looks kind of mediocre, but uh, being able to surprise it with uh, Valyrian Steel, and once you find Patience, you are effectively able to reuse any of your enter play reactions. That's Aria Hotar, Dornish Spy, uh, Tristane Martel, Southern Messenger, uh, green blood trader as well you're just able to very easily reuse those cards and trigger valyrian steel at the same time um even even sometimes marshalling on those cards is just useful in itself Have, having patience on a card that has an enter player reaction can really throw your opponent off because at any point you can return that to your hand and then reuse it if you have the gold or you know ariane martel or, or obara sand a very underrated card in my mind especially for this deck so it's very nice here when you see it and that should be all 18 attachments. Uh, <laughs> uh, 17. 17. Oh, Why no. did we okay. miss again? I'll just, I'll just list them out for you. Okay. So I forgot to add patience, even though I had it uh, <laughs> on screen for about a minute. <laughs> you were being patient about it. That's fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> okay. So uh, we can just quickly see um, if there's anything that... Um, stands out here that you did not include let me just uh, have a quick look so i would yeah. have a question on, on that uh Stephen. so yeah. one thing um when i uh, tried to, uh, to play material valyrian steel uh, not mm -hmm. very successfully i uh, was locked away and it would yes. also be a control card so what's your thinking on that so locked away it is a very interesting card and i'll be honest it's probably worthwhile testing it in this version of the deck and i can get to that a little bit later as to why it would that's the case um <clears throat> but it's a card where in my mind it's doing a lot of what other characters are already doing but it's not giving you anything more than just doing that effect so for example you have i know they're not you know they can technically be saved here but you've got those Tristan Martels and Southern Messengers that are already bouncing back to hand. Um, it is still a very 
good way to you know if you're able to do this in the uh one of the later phases just maybe just before the standing phase for next turn or or, or even in the uh, draw phase somehow it's always good it does require <clears throat> if you want to get full uh, effectiveness out of it i would say you'd want to be using it in the draw phase and that does require your plots to properly reflect you know, make sure that you have that gold available to trigger Valyrian Steel and put it into play and bounce that person immediately. It requires your your plot line to fit that, and this current iteration doesn't have that sort of plot line. So, mm -hmm. if you do have those, like you know, trading with the uh, sorry trade routes, sorry, uh, and and, and uh, what's what's the character one? Um, Calling the banner. That's the one. Uh, if you have cards like that, then locked away makes more sense. So you can, you know, use it as in its most ef efficient manner. Uh, but outside of that scenario, it's it wasn't finding as much use. Okay. But yeah. Yeah. Just uh, looking through the attachments, uh, one more that stands out to me: Strangler. I've seen used a lot with uh, Valyrian mm -hmm. Steel because you can uh, put it in, into play mid challenge to uh, basically yep. win one. Yes. Yeah, so Strangler was actually the last one that I had to, that I cut in this deck. So it, it's definitely one that you can slot in. You just need to figure out what else you want to take out. For me, it actually competed with the Patience slot, um, and it actually, to me, it proved more useful. Patience proved more useful. Um, it's definitely not to say that Strangler is a bad card in this scenario. It's 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 really really good, but yeah, g generally if you're if your deck is doing its thing correctly, you're going to either be locking your opponents out of those challenges completely, or you're going you, you don't want them to have low strength, you want them to have high strength so you can kneel them all with your, you know, forcing defenders cards and trigger lose to win conditions like, you know, we'll have Dawn later on as I mentioned. Um things like that to help you uh win that. So even though it is useful it's it, it it just it's the nineteenth attachment I would say, in this deck. Okay. Th th there were other minor considerations as well. I did uh, consider the mountain skull, as well. Uh, primarily as it's it's a it's a unique card that could potentially trigger, uh, in the plot phase, for example, to get a really interesting Valyrian steel trigger. Uh, and outside of that, it's just a you know. Plus two strength and gaining renown is always great if you have the three gold to pay for that attachment. Um, but similar to Strangler, it wasn't as useful as other cards. So I would say, you know, the Strangler is the next uh, light card and the Mountain Skull, I think, was just below that. Um, so they had to make the cut, unfortunately. All right. So okay. the, then the locations, right? Yes. So we'll move on to locations. Uh, so uh, I was talking earlier about um, used plot tech. And uh, you can see that there are quite a few expensive location uh, attachments. Sorry, so you can obviously assume Martel is going to utilize the Water Gardens. So we have three copies of the Water Gardens, which is sometimes unconventional, but it, it really does make sense here. You want to find that location as quickly as possible uh, because once you do that, Water Gardens converts itself into either an extra gold on top of the economy that it's saving you, an extra gold because of Valyrian Steel, or an extra card because of Valyrian Steel. So one one-cost card converting into you know economy and those two extra things for free sounds like a fantastic idea. Uh, and it's very useful here. Um, yeah. the, the second staple location, which is one of the very recent additions that I've been loving, is... Brand the Builder Sunspear. So three copies of that fit this deck. Two obvious reasons, or two, one obvious reason and one subtle reason. There's a lot of uh, Lords and Ladies in this deck, or at least enough Lords and Ladies for it to make sense. Uh, a few of them being Lords and Ladies that you'll want to be jumping in and out of play, primarily looking at Ariane Martel and Tristane Martel, if you can find that patience. I know it's a 1 in 75 chance, but it does happen. Otherwise, you know, it's giving you a passive one, one extra gold. Now, the reason I really like it is it actually works with Valyrian Steel. So the action for Valyrian Steel, you can pay the gold on Sunspear because you're spending gold as if it was in your gold pool. Mm. So it's an extra reserve to help though chuck in those Valyrian Steel um, attachments. Your opponent will see you have zero gold and then be baffled as to how you just 
brought in that sort of the morning from your hand for three gold because you took the money off of Sunspear. Yes. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. So, uh, Sunspear works during the challenges phase. I was thinking when you um, mentioned it that maybe you were trying to actually get it to trigger in three different phases here. So, it's kind of like the Tyrell High Tower where you expect to marshal something and then uh, ambush something, so you get two triggers. But mm -hmm. here you would get uh, something in marshalling, then something in <clears throat> with ambush in the challenges phase, and maybe you use uh, Valyrian Steel in the third phase just to build up that economy. But I'm guessing uh, mostly you're doing uh, the Valyrian Steel triggers in challenges, if you can. Yeah, unless like, it, it depends on what you find, really. So some cards, you know, if you find those ambush attachments like Venomous Blade and uh, Secret Pact, you can, and you have a Water Gardens, for example, you can just naturally do it yourself, uh, and you don't have to rely on Valyrian Steel. And then it saves you being able to use that Valyrian Steel in another phase, because as we know with the redesigned Valyrian Steel, you want to try to spread out those reactions amongst your phases. Well, Sunspear is trying to do the same thing. So if you have the opportunity to spread those reactions out, you want to do that. So in countless, uh, multiple times, I, for example, I had a... Um, like an icon attachment that didn't really matter in the challenges phase, that I would Valyrian Steel in the dominance phase with just a one goal that I had left over, trigger Valyrian Steel, trigger Sunspear, just for the sake of it. So, yeah, and in this, but in the scenarios where you don't have those ambush cards or you want to, you know, put in a card without ambush, yeah, Sunspear is just going to be triggering the challenges phase as well. Yeah, and I think uh, we have an opportunity here to address something also that I read the uh particularly in the Iron Throne uh, chat lobby a lot. Uh, people are saying that Sunspear is really bad. It's one of the worst uh, of these five cost strongholds. But I think uh, any time I've played against it and uh, I haven't actually played with it that much, but uh, when I play against it, it always seems to hold its own just fine. I think uh, your experience has been similar, has it not? Yes, yeah, it, it, it's definitely, it, it, it's been worth it in my mind been great in my mind. For sure. Yeah, so on, on some spirit, I would make the distinction it might not be the most spectacular because it's, you know, just uh, another gold reserve. But I also think it might not be the strongest, but I also don't think it's the worst one. So um, I think it's a nice one. And I, it's really interesting how you're using it here. Yeah. yeah. And I'll, I'll be entirely honest. I actually uh, discovered this reaction or this interaction completely by accident. <laughs> I was playing online, and I thought, oh, I'll chuck in one copy of the new Sunspear, you know, I have Lords and Ladies, let's see how it goes. And then when I triggered Valyrian Steel, it's like, why can I choose up to five gold worth, sorry, up to three gold worth of characters, when I, uh, attachments when I have one gold? I'm like, oh my gosh, it's Sunspear. And so from there, it it's shot, and it's always been useful whenever I find it. Obviously, things like Water Gardens as well make it uh, a lot more affordable as well. Um... So, following Sunspear, um, we then have two copies of Dawn, obviously redesigned Dawn. Um, this is just for obvious reasons. It's a very useful card here. Um, you want to try to be... You're going through a 75-card deck. It's one of the draw cards that you just want to keep on you know, cycling through, finding the right cards you need, finding those combos that you know work. Uh, it's there. Um, you, could, you could very easily fit three copies here. For me, I've skimmed, skimmed it down to two just as I have found other draw cards are also working just as well. And, um, you know, I, I've been trying to test one or two other cards here and there and, you know, bringing Dawn down by one has been... I haven't really found that as much of a problem. Uh, it's not as integral as it needs to be. Um, following that, you know, we're talking about icon control and, and all of that. Some, uh, so we've got Starfall, one copy of Starfall. Uh, everyone's favorite three cost uh, location. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, this is all for obvious reasons. Um, it's it's sort of surprise icon control, but at the same time, it isn't. Uh, it's just very, it's just so versatile in this scenario. Um, I'd considered bumping that up to two as well, uh, but you know, trying to keep that that deck at at seventy five, you're already going through a lot of cards. You don't want to overdo it. Um, and one of the plots will make sense as to why this is a low count as well. We then will move into uh, one copy of Isle of Ravens. <clears throat> uh, this card isn't necessarily integral to the deck. I've just found it simply uh, useful. Um, 
with reusing some of the, you know, having the chance to reuse some of these events, but also uh, there's a, a few terminal attachments that seeing multiple copies of here is actually quite beneficial for you, you know. Uh, and considering you have one copy of all these attachments, finding more is just better. Um, but that is one location that, you know, it's a bit of a flexible flexible spot in this deck, so you you can, you know, take that out for something else if you'd like. Uh, and then the remainder of the economy package, you know, as along with Water Guard and Sun Spear, of course, uh, we have three copies of Summer Sea Port and three copies of Blood Orange Grove. Um, both, you know, fairly straightforward reasons. They're just good economy in this deck. Mm -hmm. okay. Seems almost a little short on uh, economy. So are uh, Water Gardens mm -hmm. um, and Valyrian still doing the job there? Yeah, so so this deck has very clear, um, a very clear economy shortage because there's cards that I've noticed that are actually doing that for me. One being, you know, if you fall if you fall short in your economy, you have Valyrian Steel. We have we will have a an economy plot that um, works fairly well, and we'll have an economy event as well. Um, but the whole point of Valyrian Steel, in my mind, is it's meant to balance out your deck. You know, if you if you fall short of your draw cards, but you have economy, Valyrian Steel is going to cover that for you. If you fall short of your economy cards and you have you know other cards that you, you're drawing and you can't play, Valyrian Steel is going to help cover you in that scenario as well. So I've noticed that this balance of economy does work surprisingly well, um, but I can understand why someone would maybe want to put one or two more economy cards in there. But I haven't really found the the need for it thus far yeah, interesting probably good to move on to the events now as well now most of these uh they, 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 sorry just to make sure there's 16 locations as well in case we missed one yes we got it right this time perfect <laughs> um so we've got six events now some of these events i would say are quite flexible so martel have a plethora of good events they can use in this scenario um these are just most of the ones that I found have become the most useful lately for me, but you know, this it can always be adjusted based on the meta. So one copy of emissioned in Essos. Now this might this might be a bit of a, a wonder as to why, but one copy of this card has been surprisingly useful when trying to find a a key lord or lady. So for example, uh if you find your seven cost Doran Martel and uh, but you, you need to start seeing a win condition later on. That mission to Essos can return him to hand, fetch you six cost Red Viper. If you're very desperate <laughs> and you need to bounce someone back to hand, or you need something in some, you need to prevent an opponent from, to prevent a character from, you know, being in play, I guess, uh, you could return something like Red Viper to fetch Tristan Martel as a surprise trigger for him. Uh, Similarly, it can also just simply be used, similar to Patience, to just return a card to hand. Because the way that it's worded, uh, if you don't find that trait, that card just is returned to hand. Um, unless if it's uh, cancelled, of course. Um, oh, sorry, it's also useful uh, if you if you got Doran Martell on the field, for example, and you're looking for to save him from a potential reset, bounce Ariane Martell back to hand to find Malaria of Norvos. Uh, same thing with Laria Sand finding either Namiria Sand or Avara Sand, or even one of those finding a Shadow City Bastard. There's a, there's a lot of what I like to call cascading traits in this deck um, that just one copy of this attachment can find itself useful in a game. Um, so that's, that's there for that reason. <clears throat> um, now, you were talking about economy before. This deck, one of the recent additions I've made, and this is based on one of the RL changes, is I put in one copy of Indoran's name. Um, I haven't had a lot of opportunities to test this, but it just does make sense. Um, you've got a bit of that use plot tech here, and you're sacrificing one trigger of, of Valyrian Steel action to likely gain yourself like three or more gold, which is, in my mind, always useful. Um, that could potentially be bumped up to, you know, two if you are worried about economy, um, but that seems to be the way to go in my mind. Yeah, and here's um, the faction card, so it's um, it conflicts with the agenda a bit here. Yes, yes. It uh, keep in mind it conflicts with the agenda. It also does conflict with Doran Martell, and I, I, I will get to that later. But there are minor conflicts here, but you don't 
usually when you see one, you're you're happy with you have you know which one you want to choose in 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 the challenger phase. But yes, you're right. It's it's one of the conflicting cards. Um, and then the other the final events, we've got two copies of his Viper Eyes. Now this is a very um, I guess a, a, these two slots here are very flexible in my mind. Um, lately, I've been using Viper Eyes just because you've got a bit of return to hand tech. Um, you can, uh, I know it wor only works on defense, but you can be forcing some opponents to attack you uh, with Fowler Twins, but that's a very minor interaction here. You know, Viper Eyes is just generally a very good event for zero gold. Um, and it can get rid of those key cards uh, and can actually help with some of the issues that this deck faces, which I can get into later, basically being, you know, opponent having better control than you do um <clears throat> and the final two cards is one of my favorite events in the game uh doran's game uh that just works here as one of the win conditions along with uh the red viper and it when you fight start seeing some of the right cards for example obviously the red viper himself you start seeing dora martel where you can remove an opponent from a challenge same thing with area hotar you start finding dawn you start finding hotar's axe you start finding those cards that are going to boost your strength and make sure you can fairly easily win by five. This event here is a bit of a no-brainer. Um, you do have that very minor window that uh, you sort of need to find the card when you're about at f around four to five use plots. So that is the one downside of this uh, event at this point. But I did notice that this deck here, it has the control. It doesn't so much have a very clear win condition. And so I made those win conditions Doran's game and the Red Viper, uh, so that's why that's in there. If you find if you manage to find a different win condition in this deck, you can probably cut Doran's game, but it it, fa it fills a fairly good role here um, in this deck. Yeah. Um, it's so always a problem for me in control decks to find something to gain power quickly. So I was going to ask you, there's a, a re well not recently released, but one of the the um, uh, design team cards that uh, deals yep. with this icon control uh, i forget the name so it's a house sandstone. corner location sandstone uh, sandstone right so uh yeah is there any chance that you would you would be able to make that work in this deck uh i would say yes there is definitely a chance um i actually when that card first came out i actually experimented it with this deck and i found that the scenarios where it worked was realistically it was only when i found both the red viper and when i found enough icon control um and preferably challenge pull as well so it, it required three it required the red viper and for me to both have a really established icon control board and an established challenge pull board for that event to be able to earn me any realistically any power whilst Doran's game was sort of doing that without requiring the icon control aspect and the uh, challenge pull aspect. Um, but it just does work with Red Viper, but it also works with everyone else. Um, it's a bit harder to win, uh, to have low icon characters in the challenge, especially when they see Sandstone. Like, they see that on the board. They're not going to defend with their low icon characters if they know they're going to lose it. Because what's the point of just giving you free power? So it was a very telegraphed uh, location. Hopefully, with, if there's any more icon control um, introduced, it might be more and more useful, or more specifically, surprise icon control, as I mentioned before. Um, but at this current moment, it, it it wasn't making the cut, unfortunately. But you could definitely try it out. Uh, but I agree. I also had the feeling that uh, it tends to be win more and uh, or can be played around very well, well by the op opponent so yeah if i have everything uh, in there and have sort of the morning to draw them in against their will and i can win in any way then i probably will win the game anyway and i'll still mm -hmm. yeah, just uh, not oppose uh, so i think it's actually a nice design but it hasn't found uh, its place i think yet in my health yeah yeah not yet but hopefully soon <laughs> um and so, so that should be, again, six events. Uh, I don't know if we can miss any of those. <laughs> there was a small amount of events there. No, um, that's 75 cards. <laughs> fantastic. All right, so that's that's the bulk of the deck. You can sort of see what it's doing there. And so a lot of the plots now, um, 
they try to they try to fill in in my mind fill in a few of the gaps of this deck as well as just helping with the uh, helping a little bit with the control aspect but the plot line here as i've mentioned it's it's the last thing i've mentioned here you can work with a, quite a few uh, plot lines as i mentioned as we mentioned before with um uh with locked away you can go with a plot line that um gives you gold you know during the plot phase itself to utilize like valyrian still triggers in different phases and that's definitely that's 100 percent viable um the way that i found that it worked was not relying on those cards and trying to find cards that synergize with that it just freed up a lot of space in my deck and so a lot of these are fairly standard plots um we'll start off with uh the very staple martel plot and from martel opener we've got prince doran's behest um that's for very obvious reasons it's it's just it's primarily adding one extra use plot you know it's going to help your you know you, you're, you're very likely to see water gardens early on because of three copies of it so being able to immediately reduce itself uh, you know the cost of playing itself is always a big plus and you know it does also work with dawn it does also work with doran's game um following that your actual opener i guess would be uh, i found a lot of use with the maiden so a very standard opener nowadays um the reason here is it's because it's a control deck there are different moments in this game where you want to go second and there are different moments in this game where you want to go first uh the moments where you want to go second is where you have more control available so you have all those icon control of attachments you have dawn martel you have um uh fowler twins for example uh and you want your opponent to be able to put his board out before you put yours out. That's a very obvious thing with control. You like to go second. In the scenarios where you like to go first is when you start to see those key cards like the Red Viper and Sword of the Morning and Ilaria Sand, where you can then use your own uh, form of attacking to control your board, your opponent's board. So in those scenarios, you want to go first. But something like the Maiden giving that plus two initiative is just always going to be useful in this scenario uh, for you to have a lot of agency on when you go first and when you go second um this plot can be swapped out with um something like time of plenty if if that works as well you know an extra card for draw is always good but i've found currently that the maiden is just doing a better job um okay so you're always going behest yeah. into maiden there's no uh choice depending on what the opponent does i know summer tedx uh, they have a combination they could have for instance neighbor superiority or they could have summer harvest if they mm. uh, run into late summer feast or something like that yeah no you're not really reacting your op- to your opponent's starting plot um there are you know there are small scenarios where you can flip into a different plot from behest um but nine out of ten times you're, you're going to be flipping into the maiden because it's also just a you know six gold is always useful and following an additional reason why it's useful is you're running you're also running one copy of the smith i feel like this one's fairly obvious um you're turning your a lot of your passive location uh, passive attachments into location control um and because of the maiden it's turning it into a six six one six plot which is as everyone would probably agree is really good stats um and yeah one thing to always note with the smith and this is just a general rule with the smith Make sure you trigger the smith first. <laughs> Cancel your opponent's economy if you can. Otherwise, they do get that action window to kneel their economy. If you if you marshal a card, they then are meant to have an action window to kneel their economy. So the first thing you always want to do is kneel their economy if you have it available. Uh, next, we'll go into uh, Late Summer Feast. Um, now, this is, this is one of your big economy plots uh it's also another one that you could flip into first turn um after behest uh the main reason for that is you have those big characters if you find for example a duped two copies of doran martel in your hand on turn one flipping into a late summer feast and starting that you know form of control early on is always going to be beneficial for you you can always delay the maiden by one turn it's not not a big deal um, it wouldn't have really been helping you with late summer feast either anyway, because you know two initiative is still fairly low. Um, so going behest late summer feast and maiden is still perfectly viable here. Um, it's also got the downside of you know 
up to you in a challenge, losing opponent draws a card. You can just ride out that turn and just not do anything. Uh, you know, you're Martel, you've got Dawn, you've got Viper Eyes, you can lose challenges and not be too upset about it. Uh, you've also got Lingering Venom, of course. So, yeah, that's a very staple economy plot here. Um, we then follow up with another card that's filling the gaps, being uh, Exchange of Information. Um, this is the restricted choice here. And it's uh, it's it's been competing with me. It's been competing with uh, Secret Schemes as draw. Lately, I've simply found uh, Exchange of Information has been more consistent for me. With Secret Schemes, I've, a lot of the time, it's actually been just sitting in my hand because I've found the economy... Uh, and so Valyrian Steel has been acting as my draw, and I've sort of just been sitting on that copy of Secret Schemes and not really, not really finding a whole lot of use out of it. You know, I'd be finding more use out of using the, the faction Neil for Valyrian Steel. So, and, and with Secret Schemes, I didn't really find much use having one copy of that. I'd want to have at least two or three. So instead, I decided let's cut that, try out Exchange of Information. You have a decent. I know you have obviously more attachments than. Um, uh, events or locations, but you have you still have a fairly even even spread of um, card types. And keep in mind as well that anything that finds you an attachment is always good because that converts into economy or draw. So this is again one of those cards. Um, just makes sense. Yeah, I think uh, it's uh, almost guaranteed to get three here. It's uh, unlikely to get yeah. four with only six events, but uh, to miss on any of the other card types would be really unfortunate statistically, I think. Definitely, yeah. Um, and realistically, like, exchange of information, a lot of the cards here you're happy to find. Um, so being given anything by your opponent is always good. Our, la our second last plot is then, and this one is a bit of a... It could work... And I found that it's worked, but I can I, I can see reasoning as to why it couldn't, uh, being Mad King's Command. Now, I've noticed with Mad King's Command, it's been very useful when you can have, similar to Exchange of Information, when you can have a very even spread of card types, more specifically being characters, attachments, and locations. In this scenario here, whenever I've used Mad King's Command, it's almost always hurt my opponent a lot more than it hurts me, than it's hurt me. Um, I have usually had to get rid of an attachment or two, but it's usually a fairly easy choice for me. Um, additionally, if I choose my opponent to go first, I can know what characters they're not keeping, and so I can just simply, you know, not choose those attachments. They'll go to the bottom of the deck, but, you know, they weren't going to be utilized anyway if it's not another character. Uh, so, and, and with, with Mad King's Command and Maiden, you, you're at eight initiative. So you, you usually can choose that, uh, first player on that turn. Um, otherwise it's then just another high, uh, initiative plot to go first. If you're, if you find the Red Viper with good attachments on him, having him and two other characters, like, you know, if you have him, Doran Martell, and even an uh, Ariane Sand, something as simple as that, you're usually going to have a better, uh, turn than your opponent and importantly having three characters on their board is now only three characters that you have to control so for example you if you have sword of the morning in play you've immediately controlled his entire board um you know obviously they need the icons but point being that um there's there's those challenge pool cards there's those icon control cards there's those control cards they're going to have a bad time being narrowed down to three characters um, additionally, on top of that as well, you have the added draw from Valyrian Steel to very fairly easily get your cards back after that point. So being narrowed down to three cards at hand can be a struggle in some scenarios, but you usually hold that for when you've been focusing a bit on economy with Valyrian Steel and you're, you know you're going to be, if you know you're going to be hitting Mad King's Command soon, you know, you play ahead and you're, you, you, you don't really feel the hit. Um, so that that's the reset of the plot. Um, it's working fairly well. The last card is a bit of a flex plot in my mind. Um, lately, I've been slotting it in with uh, close call. Uh, the reason for that, you know, it's fairly straightforward. If a Doran Martell or a Red Viper or some a key character of yours gets killed, close call is going to get them back. Uh, well, 
get them back into the game, you know, hopefully you need to draw another copy of them, which is very possible with the amount of draw this deck does put out. Um, it's also giving you an extra card, but yeah, there, there's a lot of options for this last plot. Um, I know some people have uh, chosen the long plan is also like a useful one, but um, that's only if you feel things like economy uh, or if you're running with that, um, you know, having gold during the plot phase plot line, then cards like long plan makes more sense. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of options for that plot, but I found this one has been very useful lately. And I believe that should be all seven plots. Yeah, looks nice. Okay, so um, this is, uh, you said, uh, you described this as a control deck, so you would usually then expect the game to go long, close to time, for instance, in a tournament setting. Yes, yeah, that, that would be the case here. Um, it's a control deck until you find your key cards, essentially. So the quicker you can find those cards, the quicker your game's going to usually go. Uh, but you're right, it's, it's, you will be battling for time a little bit in an actual tournament scenario. And so what are you um, good against with this deck, and against what kind of decks do you struggle? Yes, so I'll start with the struggles. Um, you definitely struggle, I think one, this might be a bit obvious, you struggle against decks like Night's Watch Anything, uh, the amount of no attachments except weapon that they have, or no attachments in general, it just it eliminates like half of your attachments from even being usable. Um, they also have some decent cards, especially lately, like Great Ranging and all that, which uh, they have, they're able to control your board a lot quicker than you can. Uh, and if you combine that with some other cards like um, Sir Jeremy Riker, for example, they have the icon boost that they need in the, in the current big Night's Watch deck that it's just difficult to, uh, to control their side, especially without being able to put attachments on those cards. Um, it also does struggle a bit with, um, if you're, uh, as I mentioned earlier, if your opponent has uh, better control than you do. So for example, um, if key cards like Dora and Martell, Red Viper, if they get Milk of the Poppy, then you don't manage to find your save cards, for example, being Sweet Sleep or um, even uh, an emergency uh, mission in Essos. That can also be used in a way to combat those um, those forms of control. Then uh, you know your opponent's going to be beating you in that scenario because you can't use your big forms of control. Um, and although the deck itself isn't actively used a lot, I know Targaryen with um, uh, what is it? The Shadow of the uh, their Shadow card, their Shadow Event. Sorry, Shadow of um, the East. The East. Shadow of the East, that's it. Uh, Shadow of the East has... It, it just completely obliterates this deck um, for fairly obvious reasons. Um, getting rid of those key cards at key moments is just... Yeah, it, it doesn't it doesn't do well for you. Um, but luckily, you're not, you don't see those decks at the moment too much. Uh, yeah, I would say its strengths necessarily would be um, decks that have... A lot of key unique characters this just completely overrides a lot of them so you've got those uh so for example like uh the classic lannister i know it's not played as much but just as an example the classic uh lannister like tywin cersei um jamie being able to prevent those characters from particip participating in very key challenge types for example with seven cost cersei preventing her in an intrigue challenge just shuts down that entire deck with like one or two cards that you use in this deck. Um, it then just gives you a chance to, you know, build up, find your cards, and then just win. Um, it would also work fairly well in scenarios where, um, I know this might be a bit obvious, but where your opponent doesn't have a lot of tricons. <laughs> that's been a that's been a that's been a bit of a thing recently. Uh, there's been a lot more, a few more tricons in the game being being added that has just hurt icon control in general um so you know we've got if you're versing a martel mirror matchup for example there's tattered prince uh if you find you know Greyjoy uh generally are hard to work with because they've got asha they've got euron that you usually see in the same deck um that's both copies of euron um so it gets it gets a bit harder at those points but 
realistically, it's all a matter of whether you find those uh, key attachments, and really whether you find attachments at all, because the attachments are generating you more um, more cards if you need them. Um, there's been many scenarios where I've versed a deck that I could work well well against, but I've literally drawn no attachments, and it's just been a slow crawl for me to find my first attachment to start kicking off that draw, and uh, it, it it was too slow in that scenario. Um, so yeah, there's there's I'm not as certain about the exact decks that this uh, works super super well against, and that's generally because Icon Removal at the moment is a bit hard to go to work with. Um, so. Yeah, it's just in general been a very a fairly even deck in my mind. A lot of fun though. All right, yeah, looks nice. Well, I know that there's if if uh, one thing I'd recommend is that if you are trying this deck out, um, I would pl- play around with some other options because this is this has been working very well for me. But I know it suits my playstyle fairly well. The good thing about Martov Learn Steel is there's a lot of there are a lot of options that you can branch out a little bit into. Um, like those other attachments we mentioned. So give it a go and uh, make some edits and see how you go. It's a lot of fun. All right, looking forward to it. Actually, uh, I've played Icon Control quite a bit uh, over the years, but mainly it's been uh, with uh, the Shadows package, with the Shadows Sarian, uh, stuff like that. So to do it with an attachment-based deck is definitely interesting. And I like this agenda. I used to love it when... uh, the original version, of course, that was just a crazy, uh, crazy draw, crazy economy, and really needed to be redesigned. But uh, since then, kind of, I guess it's found its way in Baratheon because they have a, a nice combination of negative attachments and some positive attachments that uh, go on a lot of different characters. So uh, it's not really a problem with the targeting restrictions. And then I think Targaryen is the other deck that you see a lot with their mm. um, nice attachments package. So uh, uh, always interesting to uh, to find a new faction that can uh, make use of this agenda. And this, I think, is kind of like Baratheon in a way because it has a, a decent combination of uh, negative and positive attachments. And then I think uh, the most important thing becomes uh, finding the right characters that are going to uh, make the best use of that uh, sort of the morning, for instance, or that... Uh, the nice package that you have of characters that leave play on their own so that uh, you get to replay your stuff. So uh, looks like uh, it's going to be a lot of fun to play this. Yeah. yeah. And and as you said there, there's a lot of, there are a few cards in here that uh, you don't usually see played. And yeah, you'd probably know that I like... If, if I can find a deck that utilizes cards that have been stuck in the binder for years, such as Patience... Um, then I I just find it's a it's such a, an interesting deck, um, and your opponent doesn't expect those sort of interactions, and then they're like, oh wow, that's very interesting. I might try that. <laughs> um, I like those sorts of decks. Okay, so there we are. We have a Martel deck for you, and uh, thank you, Stephen, for joining us today. It was uh, an interesting episode. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm glad to show off an in- interesting deck and a deck close to my heart. All right. Yes. Uh, Go ahead, Tannis. So, yeah, just want to say uh, thanks. Um, it is always great to have uh, Martel Control uh, close to my heart as well. And yeah. I definitely learned something. So thanks, Stephen, and thanks, Mia, for hosting. Yeah, yeah. and to all of our viewers, uh, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.